Great, thank you. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Virginia Medicaid Assisting Jail Reentry Coordination for Behavioral Health Services webinar. We really appreciate your time today and your attendance. My name is Christina Thune. I am the Support Act Grant Coordinator in the Behavioral Health Division at the Department of Medical Assistance Services, also known as DMAS. Um, which is the state agency that oversees the Virginia Medicaid benefit. I am joined today by my colleague, Adam Krebling, who is the Support Act Grant Program Specialist. He will be working behind the scenes today to help support this webinar, um, as well as joined by three of our presenters, which I'll introduce in a second. This webinar is being recorded and we will be posting this for later viewing. We'll also send out a copy of today's slides and the location of the recording to all participants um, so that you feel free to share um, among colleagues who are not able to attend today. All participants will be muted throughout the webinar. If you have a technical problem with the webinar, please enter that into the chat and we will be looking at that and help assist with any way we can. Also, if you have any questions for the presenter, so like throughout the webinar and you have questions, please enter those into the chat. Adam and I will be monitoring and gathering those questions for the Q&A portion. We do have a closed captioning service available today. Thank you so much to the captioner who's on this call. Um, we recommend to use the link in the chat box, which I'm gonna put right now. Yes, there's a link in the chat box. You can access the service. It'll pop up a new web browser. We ask you to, um, you know, rearrange your slide deck, the slide deck and this web browser so you can see both at the same time. If you have any problems or questions about this service, please feel free to email our civil rights coordinator at DMS and their, their email address is in the chat as well. Here is today's agenda. We will have three presentations today. The first one will be from Rebecca Sutter, co-director at Mason and Partners Clinic as well as an associate professor of nursing at George Mason University. Um, she will be covering substance use disorder treatment options. We have Ashley Harold, who is the Addiction and Recovery Treatment Services, also known as ARTS, Senior Program Advisor in the Behavioral Health Division at DMAS. She will be going over an overview of the Medicaid benefit, and in particular, the types of treatment services members can access who have substance use disorder. And then our final presenter will be Suzanne Gore, a principal at State Health Partners. She will be going over how staff who work in carceral systems can support the enrollment into Medicaid while qualifying members are still incarcerated and how this can help with the reentry transition um, for, for those members access to access community-based treatment once they are reentered re back. And then our remaining time will be left over for question and answer. So again, welcome to this webinar. Please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box. Please enter your name and your organization so that our presenters can have a feel of who's on this call today. This webinar is being hosted by the Department of Medical Assistance Services via the Support Act Grants with partners at State Health Partner and George Mason University. So just a little bit of background about why we're here today. DMAS was awarded the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid Services Support Act Grant in 2019. The $4.8 million that we received um, grant has three main buckets of components. Um, first is a statewide substance use disorder needs and treatment capacity assessment. We are also doing a strength-based assessment. And then our final kind of bucket of activities is a large one. It's activities to increase substance use disorder provider treatment capacity, which includes free substance use disorder focused webinars, which I have a slide on next. The reason why we are presenting today's webinar of our grants needs subpopulations of focus are um, members who have substance use disorder and also have experience system. So to help support this subpopulation, DMAS had contracted with Health Management Associates, Health Management Associates, um, who subcontracted with six state health partners and GNU to complete a statewide analysis looking at the intersection of Medicaid, 
substance use disorder needs and the legal carceral system. And really trying to find how Virginia Medicaid can support the reentry process, as well as Virginia Medicaid working with carceral systems to continue to um, support that reentry process so that members can have access to healthcare services. And just real quick before I turn it over to Rebecca, this is a list of our um, free technical assistant training webinars that um, our team member, Paul Rassler, who is the support at Grant Behavioral Health Addiction Specialist. He is a licensed social worker who works in the substance um, use disorder treatment arena. He is offering a new series of trainings that's gonna start next week and go through March. Um, and as you can see, there's a lot of different topics. One of the new topics he's going to cover is substance use disorder treatment for adolescents. Those will be happening in March. Um, he'll also be revisiting topics that he's previously um, gone over, such as opioid stimulants and cannabis, the ASIM criteria dimensions, urine and drug screens, uh, suicide assessments, substance use disorder and trauma, as well as co-occurring disorders with mental health and substance use disorder. The registration is now open, so please, I will put the um, link into the chat box to, directly to the schedule, as well as a link to our support at grant page, which has previous webinar slides um, that you can access as well. And feel free to share this among all your colleagues. These are open for anybody who interacts directly or indirectly for um, Medicaid members. Okay. And now I'm going to hand this over to Rebecca Sutter. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. You know, it's such a it's such an important time in Virginia for us to be focusing on this. And there's some really amazing opportunities that I think um, as we look at our legal carceral system and how we can really do some really impactful and engagement and really kind of move the needle on, um, you know, this opioid use um, uh, epidemic that we're seeing just continually rise. So uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, and next slide, please. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because I know that those that are on here know that we are, you know, continuing to see a continual rise and not just opioid use disorder, but substance use disorder in, in general. And looking at at this slide, it, it's pretty much universal that we're seeing the, the continuation. This uh, these um, statistics are from quarter one of, two, of 2021, but if we were to put up the quarter two, um, we would see the same um, uh, increasing rise. There was a little bit of a stabilization in our quarter two in 2021, um, but um, as many of you may know, 2020 was the deadliest year in Virginia for overdoses, and 2021 is looking to certainly, um, you know, uh, beat, uh, beat that 2020 numbers. And so um, the, tw the quarter three uh, re report should come out around February, and so we'll continue to monitor, but it's staggering the numbers of, um, of, of overdoses that we're seeing. Um, in, um, in about, if I give you just a number, the number of fatal fentanyl overdoses in 2020 compared to 2019 increased by 72.1%. Um, and fentanyl was involved in 71.8% of all overdose rates. So we can see that that is, you know, we have to be really aggressive in really looking at how we can impact at every intercept that we possibly can. And we do know that our, um, you know, in car our um, legal carceral system, um, our jails, our prisons, our probation, our parole are really integral uh, partners in us getting ahead of this. So next slide, please. So this is one of my favorite uh, slides to show because I want to talk a little bit about recovery in a general sense. And so there was a study that was done and it looked across five different uh, domains of those that have alcohol and other drugs. That's what AOG, the alcohol and other drugs. And it looked at a retrospective review of what was happening over 40 years on those that were um, had um, alcohol and other drug uh, disorders. It looked at quality of life, happiness, the recovery capital, which is really the people place Places and things that support people sustaining recovery. Looked at psychological distress and self esteem. You know, the four areas that we really want to focus on a positive quality of life, happiness, recovery capital, and self esteem all over that period of time show a nice trajectory upwards and improvement across all of those domains. And at the same time, over that 40 year period, you can take a look and see that red line that's, that's arrowed down. Um, you can see that the psychological distress over time for those that remain in, in recovery comes down beautifully. And so right around that eight to 10 year mark, there's this really nice um, 
uh, recovery uh, and people are in a good position. But I want to go to the next slide, because if you look at the same indices and the same things over a 2 year period of time, you can really see that um, uh, the same quality of life, happiness, recovery capital, although you'll see the recovery capital come up, stabilize and then come down a little bit as, as things go. The uh, as self esteem is um, at the quality of life, happiness, recovery and self esteem are at the lowest points around uh, 6 months to 1 year. Um, the psychological distress that is peaking at that time frame. So what we know by looking at that is that although we know from the over the long term that people's lives get better, it certainly isn't without these times of real difficulty. It's these times that we know we need to continually wrap around people, keep them engaged in systems of care, keep them connected to recovery and recovery services. And I, I firmly believe that 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 uh, that, that this is going to occur through not just us providing direct clinical care, but us really working about the engagement pieces to keep people in the systems. So I, I think this is a really powerful. And again, there's the reference there for you to take a look at, but it's a really powerful reminder to us all um, that if this gets better, but certainly there's times that we need to be wrapping and, and having higher engagement with those that are most at risk. So next slide, please. So this was a seminal study that was done and it really, really looked at incarceration and reentry um, without medications for opioid use disorder. And what it really looked at was, you know, although there's varying numbers and varying percents of increases that we see universally, um, one study showed there was 129 times greater risk of drug overdose in the first two weeks after release from incarceration. Th those numbers can vary and usually they vary across the research because of the different and um, uh, people that they're looking at and how they're actually setting that research up. But universally, the first two weeks post uh, release from inca any incarceration is the highest um, risk for overdose. Um, and again, um, it's something for us, you know, on this call today to be really aware of is how we can really kind of identify them early. Um, look at the risk and connect them quickly. Um, I looked at who was on today and it looks like thanks for putting that in the chat. It looks like there's a lot of peers on here. I'm a firm supporter of peer recovery specialists and their ability to engage, sustain engagement, um, especially in this early period of time of readaptation re into the community. Um, and so um, just a reminder to us all about this, this really um, uh, risky time frame and for us to be you know, focusing on high intensity care for them at that time. Um, so next slide, please. So let's talk about these are all the things that we you know are trying to really work towards improving overdose rates, connections. Um, but it's no longer a question whether or not medication should be part of the conversation for those that have moderate to severe opioid use disorder. Medication assisted treatment, or now known as medication for opioid use disorder, or MOUD, is now the evidence-based best practice period as it relates to us having long-term success with recovery. So, what is medication assisted treatment? It has 2 domains. Um, it has a behavioral health and normally that um, is about is around cognitive behavioral therapy and then there's medications. And so I'm going to focus a on the medications, but before we move on to talk about some of the physiological reasons why medication plays a role in those with moderate with those with opioid use disorder. I want to talk about uh, why behavioral why the combination of these 2 is so important. We know that the cravings that come along with opioid use disorder in particular um, become uh, all consuming. And if we are unable to kind of talk through the, or, or work through the cravings to get to the point where we can actually focus on the cognitive behavioral therapy, it becomes exceedingly challenging for an individual. So we, we, uh, the combination of these two really allow for the beautiful pieces of recovery uh, uh, pieces that we need to, uh, to move for individuals. All right, so let's talk about the physiological pieces of this. Next slide, please. So again, this is one of my favorite visuals as it relates to how I uh, talk through medication to treat opioid use disorder. In your brain, there's something called a mu receptor. And when that, those are the little dots that you see in the brain um, right there. When that mu receptor is empty, it's an overwhelming craving that occurs. It's an overwhelming uh, physiological or physical symptoms that will occur as well as the uh, psychological piece of, um, 
of this disease. So when it's empty is what we're trying to really focus on here. That's when we need to, um, that's where medication can really play a part. If you look at the bottom of that visual, you will see that on the left side is what we've known for many, many years as the gold standard of medication to treat um, opioid use disorder, and that's the methadone. Methadone is a synthetic that that will come in and it will what we call fully um, fully um, go into the receptor, and you you will have um, you'll decrease the cravings. The problem with methadone is um, that it is difficult for people to reengage in their life when they have to go someplace every single day. And what we know about recovery is that it's about people, places, and things. If we can really move to people not. Uh, to changing those do domains of their lives. Um, and so going every day to a clinic can be really challenging when you're trying to resustain your, your life and you're trying to reengage in, in your job and being, um, you know, uh, uh, having those pro social um, um, activities there. On the opposite side of that little receptor there, you'll see it says naltrexone. Naltrexone is an antagonist. And what that means in medical world is that it's a blocker. So it, you know, although somebody may use, um, it wouldn't allow for that mu receptor to get any response from that use. And so it's an antagonist or a blocker. But what you don't see there, again, when the receptor is empty, you see that people will have these significant cravings and they'll crave and they'll crave and they'll seek and they'll seek. It, there was now Trexone, there's some evidence that it will, it will help, but it, it doesn't really fill any of those physical, uh, um, physical symptoms of, of, of withdrawal for a patient. So there's a partial antagonist, which is the one you see in the middle. That's kind of where you can see that it doesn't feel completely like the methadone, but it certainly has some effect in the um, mu receptor itself. And so what it does is it quiets that craving. And if we can quiet the craving, we can work on the cognitive behavioral therapies that we know uh, and the therapies that we know can actually build skills so that there will Will be more strength in resisting the use. And so by the combination, if somebody comes into us and they've been in active use for a period of time and they're, you know, they have moderate to severe opioid use disorder, um, without addressing the physical withdrawal pieces and without giving some tools to quiet that cravings, it becomes very, very challenging for us to do the behavioral therapy side of it. So to get together, this is the now evidence-based best practice. Um, you know, there are studies that uh, people always ask me, um, well, how long do I have to be on this medication? Well, our experts tell us that we should be on at least three years is minimum the amount of time that we really need a medication assisted treatment um, to have a long term success in, in recovery. But I have to tell you that I'm not that the evidence also shows that there is no we shouldn't stop medications just after that three years that we really need to individualize that for the client and we really need to think about treating this like it is a disease. Again, we've changed the chemical, um, the chemicals and, and the way that our brain processes. And so we wouldn't stop medication for another chronic disease. And evidence is certainly showing that we shouldn't stop medication for this chronic disease. So next slide, please. So I just want to talk a little bit about some of the benefits that, that of sustaining. Obviously, there's the uh, evidence that has really shown that this is the best. Um, this is the best way that we can keep people in long term recovery um, by giving them a quieting of their of their uh, cravings and giving them skill building through that behavioral health side. Um, we also see a decreased criminal activity and risk of becoming victim uh, or victim in of violent crimes. Retention we talked about decreased risk of of uh, hepatitis C and HIV transmission, and in general, a decrease in uh, our public health and, and um, communicable diseases. Um, decrease uh, risk of low birth weight, premature birth, and any complications during pregnancy. And there's some fabulous programs right now that are in Virginia that are looking. I was on a webinar yesterday um, that um, Ashley and her team supported, uh, really hearing about some of the dynamic work that's happening to really early identify those uh, pregnant women and get them connected to the medication assisted treatment and the um, behavioral health that will really has really shown to have outcomes. But I want to look at this last one up here the decreased risk of death 
this 15 times. If we can have people that are on medication assisted treatment, we are decreasing their risk of overdose death by 15 times. That is a staggering number. And especially where we are with our numbers now with our overdose rate, this has to be part of the conversation. We have to be looking at how to connect people both seamlessly and throughout both incarceration and in reentry into the community um, into this into this evidence based best practice that we know of all these benefits. So next slide, please. Okay, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this slide. So I want to get to the next slide that I think may have more interest. So these are just some of the myths that we hear regularly that we're trading um, the, one medication for the other. The evidence just doesn't show that. And we know that there's a biological um, change that we need to be addressing. That it, that it provide that medication assisted uh, treatment will uh, disrupt and hinder hinder a patient's recovery process. Again, there's no um, research that has shown that medication assisted treatment does anything except for improve retention rates in recovery and improve retention in connection to systems of support. Um, overdose increases the risk for overdose in patients. That has not been shown um, either. Um, and that, that uh, obviously medication assisted treatment, like we talked about, the, there's physiological changes that we need to be addressing. So abstinence, although is one treatment option, um, has not been proven because of those physiological changes, especially for those that have moderate to severe substance and opioid use disorder. I also, before we move on, I just want to say I'm talking about medications for opioid use disorder, and but fully aware that substance use disorder um, crosses all, and and many many times um, it's not just opioids, but it's others. But for this conversation, I wanted to really focus on those with opioid use disorder. Next slide, please. So this is kind of the fun part. So although um, we have all of this evidence about, about uh, people uh, needing medication assisted treatment, sometimes the navigation between um, or for those that are in, in um, have, have a, a opioid use disorder is challenging. Um, it's why I am a huge advocate for peer recovery specialists, not only because their ability to actually understand the recovery process and understand the resources many times have utilized those resources themselves, um, but also because of the live life and engagement piece that they can provide in systems of support. I am I am a director of the of an uh, office based opioid treatment. Um, I have um, been part of the conversation for about five years now, and have worked to really develop models of connectivities, most specifically around those in the criminal justice system, and in coming into the community based systems of support. Always through those connections, our peers, and so again, um, it's about continued engagement and seamless transitions that is going to make the difference at an individual level. Um, so our model that we've been utilizing in Prince William County, it's called, um, and in collaboration with our partners there, both our, our adult detention center partners, as well as our local and state probation and parole, um, is a program called Empowered Communities Opioid Project. And it really is looking at how we can work as a system um, for individuals to get connected. It's looking at our policies and procedures, how we can actually have the conversation, how we can um, build uh, infrastructure so that there is that warm handoff and the ability for peers to come into our adult detention center, engage and connect them even um, sometimes prior to release into getting um, connected within a, a short amount of times, usually within 24 hours to needed services. So it's, it, we look at this as a bridge care model where we are bridging from the uh, criminal justice to community-based services to include behavioral health, uh, medication-assisted treatment, individualized uh, treatment needs, whether or not that be the best indication would be to for a bed-to-bed -bed transition. We definitely look at those, but also adding in the other components that we know um, uh, are challenging. We know that our medical outcomes for those that have opioid use disorder and those that are criminally justicely involved are not, uh, are not as good as those without. And so we really look at how we can connect them to the medical services that they need to treat the other chronic diseases that they are. Are, um, being identified as having. We look at those social determinants of health um, issues around housing, around transportation, and you know, getting the needed um, reentry. Um, we our peers definitely focus on that area. And then there's an arm on here that is looking at those uh, communicable diseases that we talked about, hepatitis C, and getting not just identification of hepatitis C, but really getting them treated for hepatitis C. 
which can be extremely challenging in a community-based setting, um, as well as identification of other, other sexually transmitted infections. Um, the population can have a significantly increased percentage of, um, as well as HIV and others. And so, again, this model has shown great success. Um, and we are excited that we will be um, looking at collaborating with other partners um, to uh, move this model um, in utilization of, again, the peers in other communities to get connections and sustained um, seamless transitions. So that's my part. I'm going to move it next on to Suzanne. So next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry. It's back to you, Ashley. I apologize. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, at Ashley Harrell, I, as Christine said, I'm in our uh, behavioral health division at the Medicaid agency and work with our addiction and recovery treatment services benefit, which is Medicaid substance use disorder benefit. Um, so we could go ahead and go to the next slide, please. So just some, some basics about what Medicaid is. Um, it is the largest source of health insurance um, in for individuals. Uh, Medicaid is the payer, the primary payer uh, for behavioral health services. Uh, Medicaid um, is a, a state program that also uses some federal funding, um, but Medicaid is, is operated uh, by the state. So Virginia Medicaid is gonna be different from potentially what North Carolina Medicaid looks like, for example. And it's not the same as Medicare. Where Medicaid is the eligibility is mainly income based. Medicare is mostly age based. And we can move to the next slide, please. So Medicaid serves over close to two million individuals. Um, we currently, as of uh, January first, just over one point nine million individuals are served by Medicaid. You can see here that the majority of individuals are going to be adults as well as children. Next slide, please. So Medicaid covers a wide variety of services, including long term services and supports, acute care, primary care services. We just implemented dental service, dental services for adults. Um, and then what I'm going to focus on today is the, the behavioral health and specifically our substance use disorder benefit, which is the addiction and recovery treatment services benefit. Next slide. So you see here uh, for uh, adults who are eligible for a full coverage Medicaid, they have uh, a full variety of services. Um, you can see here the Medicaid benefit I have said is actually better than our state health insurance, um, but covers a variety of services. And these are available to members, um, some with no co-pays or very little co-pays and no co-insurance or deductibles. Next slide, please. So Medicaid has a significant role in uh, providing uh, services uh, to help individuals um, that are in need of substance use disorder treatment and recovery. Um, so we implemented um, in 2017 the uh, Medicaid Enhanced Substance Use Disorder Benefit, or ARTS, and it covers the uh, full continuum of care, including community-based treatment, um, that Becky was talking about um, inpatient withdrawal management and even residential treatment. And then another game changer with the Medicaid is when we expanded uh, Medicaid in uh, January of 2019 or Medicaid expansion. And that was uh, allowed us to be able to cover otherwise uninsured adults um, that we were estimating uh, that we were Estimating around 400,000 uninsured adults would be eligible for Medicaid expansion, and we're, we've reached um, close to 600,000. Um, and what's unique about this is that uh, this has really benefited individuals who are incarcerated and has been a game changer uh, for us in Virginia. Next slide, please. So this is the umbrella of the arts benefit. You can see here on the left hand side, um, begin coverage of 
um, individuals needing withdrawal management or detoxification in an inpatient acute care hospital setting. We expanded residential treatment services for adults, um, uh, added partial hospitalization and intensive outpatient programs, and then the um, programs that cover uh, medication for opiate use disorder or opiate treatment programs, and a new benefit called the Preferred Office-Based Opioid Treatment Program that I'll talk about in the next slide. We also cover substance use disorder case management and then added our peer recovery support benefit in July of 2017. And the goal with ARTS is that this is uh, fully integrated, both physical and behavioral health care. All of these services are carved into our managed care contracts, um, which I'll talk about in the next couple slides. Next slide, please. We have here, if I can ask one of my colleagues to put this link in the chat for you to be able to grab. Uh, this is the ARTS member uh, fact sheet that covers kind of the basics of what the ARTS benefit is. Uh, but we also, on the back, um, the back of this fact sheet, has a contact for all of our care coordinators um, that are with our managed care organizations and also Magellan of Virginia, which is our behavioral health services administrator. Um, and what these ARTS care coordinators, why they're so important, is these are licensed clinicians that have experience with substance use disorder treatment. So it can help individuals um, not only determine, you know, what's the most appropriate level of care that they may benefit from, but also will help connect them to providers that are available in their community. Next slide, please. So this is kind of a before and after snapshot of the providers that we had um, available in Virginia that were participating in Medicaid. Um, so you can see here that there were a lot of services that Medicaid didn't cover or we didn't have providers um, participating. And now we're looking four years after ARTS was implemented and you can see the significant increases in the availability of providers across the Commonwealth. And what I like to emphasize is not only does this impact uh, our, our, our members that are eligible for Medicaid, but these providers also serve individuals who have commercial insurance or may be uninsured. Um, so this is not only a game changer for arts, but it was a game changer for everyone in the Commonwealth uh, having access to these evidence-based uh, services. Next slide, please. So when we were talking about um, provider types that are able to provide the medications for treatment of opiate use disorder, we have uh, both our preferred office-based opioid treatment and we have opiate treatment programs. And the difference between these two are our preferred office-based opioid treatment providers are OBOT, um, just as uh, like Becky was saying that um, she is uh, the director for one of the OBOTs. Is these are um, services that are primarily in a uh, primary care clinic. So like a physician or a nurse practitioner that has their buprenorphine waiver, which is allows them to prescribe buprenorphine products for the treatment of opiate use disorder. Um, it could be outpatient health clinics, psychiatry clinics, federally qualified health centers. Um, the majority of our community service boards um, are also participating as OBOTs, health departments and physician offices. And what's unique with our preferred OBOT for the Medicaid benefit is that we also require a co-located licensed behavioral health clinician. So the goal is that when an individual uh, is engaged in treatment, not only are they able to see a prescriber for the medications, but they also are able to see within the same kind of house a behavioral health clinician. The OBOT model also offers very intensive care coordination um, and then they, the focus is for the OBOT is to be able to prescribe uh, buprenorphine products or naltrexone. And then the difference with our opiate treatment programs, um, these are heavily regulated by the federal agencies um, and they involve a direct administration of medications versus a prescription. So individuals have to come daily to our OTPs to be able to obtain their medication. 
Our opiate treatment programs can also do take home doses. Uh, in some cases, uh, this was something that with, with COVID was implemented um, to keep individuals um, from having to lessen the exposure of having to come daily to obtain their medication. OTPs also have behavioral health clinicians. And again, they're the only entity that can dispense methadone for the treatment of opiate use disorder. Next slide, please. So focusing on our OBOTs, um, when we implemented ARTS in April of 2017, we had 36 sites. And as of this week, we have 187 locations throughout the Commonwealth. Again, this is um, a, kind of a game changer for the Commonwealth. The, the rates of medication for opioid use disorder were higher during episodes of treatment at these preferred OBOTs compared to just an outpatient setting. You can see here 81% compared to 56%. We also saw the co-prescribing of opioids for pain medication and benzodiazepines decline for members that were seen at uh, preferred OBOTs. And then very telling the graphic at the bottom right hand portion, you can see the change here for Medicaid members receiving medications for opioid use disorder. From 2016, we had just over 6,000 individuals receiving medications for opioid use disorder. Compared to 2020, we have almost 30,000, a 395% increase. We're talking about the, 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 uh, the impact on saving lives. Next slide, please. So we have uh, two links here um, that I want you to be able to have our list. The one on top is the list of our preferred OBOTs, and we have them by the area of the state that they're located, their address, and their, their phone number. And then we also have a list of our opiate treatment programs um, that are also available and, and displayed by um, the locality and their contact information. Next slide, please. So I wanted to share uh, with, with Medicaid, we have um, managed care organizations that the majority of individuals eligible for Medicaid in Virginia are going to be enrolled in one of our managed care organizations. Um, we have currently our Medallion 4.0 program, which you can see here serves the majority of members, primarily infants, children, pregnant individuals um, and adults, including our Medicaid expansion adults. And then we have our Commonwealth Coordinated Care, which is our Medicaid managed care benefit that is uh, primarily for individuals who have a disability or older adults that might be Medicare and Medicaid eligible. However, when individuals are newly enrolled in Medicaid, they will have a brief period of where we call it the fee-for-service period or straight Medicaid before they transition to managed care. And this includes individuals that are um, incarcerated and then transitioning to the community. They will have a brief period of that fee-for-service eligibility. And I was just to show the numbers. As of January 1st, we have just under 200,000 individuals that are in that straight Medicaid. And what's important for this is that for individuals that are in straight Medicaid, for behavioral health services, they have um, additional support that individuals um, may not have um, in the fee-for-service benefit. Uh, so next slide, please. So I wanted to share with you um, our behavioral health services administrator um, kind of what Magellan, it's Magellan of Virginia and what their role is and how significant this is for our fee-for-service members. Um, and I do want to share that we have um, some of our Magellan team on uh, online with us today. Uh, Dr. Trisha Van Rossum, who's the Director of Clinical Care Services, and Amy Croft, who is the Manager of Clinical Care Services. Um, so we'll just wanted to, to thank them for joining us today. Next slide, please. So Magellan of Virginia um, has been our Medicaid's Behavioral Health Services Administrator since 2013. 
And Magellan administers our behavioral health services benefit for members that are enrolled in both Medicaid or FAMUS. And um, I have a screenshot here of the Magellan uh, of Virginia website. Um, that is, uh, they have both a, a member facing uh, section as, a, as well as a provider facing section. And um, this is uh, very valuable because um, this is also a resource for um, individuals that uh, work in our local and regional jails um, that the Magellan team is available to help with individuals that are transitioning from carceral stays to the community and uh, are able to help locate providers for both behavioral health and substance use disorder treatment to help meet their needs. Next slide, please. So the role of uh, Magellan of Virginia um, is to create, manage, enroll, and train their provider network. They also do uh, review their clinical staff review service authorizations for behavioral health and addiction and recovery treatment services. They adjudicate and process claims. They perform quality assessment and improvement activities. They perform utilization management of services. And they also provide care coordination for members who are receiving the Medicaid covered behavioral health and addiction and recovery treatment services. Next slide, please. So this is something that I encourage you. Um, we'll make sure that we get this to you in, in the chat, and it's also on the, the member um, fact sheet for arts, is um, to keep this number for the call center um, as well as the email address. Because if you're needing help with individuals um, that you're working with that are transitioning back to the community and they're needing that connection with providers, Magellan can help you with making that connection um, so that you're not alone and you're not having to figure out who's in the Medicaid network. Um, that is the, the role and expertise of our clinical staff uh, with Magellan. Next slide, please. And then we also, on the Medicaid website, uh, we have a, a Google map um, that you're able to uh, search by uh, the the level of care. So if you're looking for a preferred OBOT that's in your area, you can actually select our preferred OBOT and then it'll pull up all of the OBOTs that are um, available across uh, the Commonwealth. Um, so we have both kind of the, the, the sheet that has all of the OBOTs listed by, um, uh, by where they are in Virginia, but we also have this interactive Google map. Um, that is a pretty neat tool uh, to be able to use with individuals. And then next, I'm going to pass it to Suzanne. Great, thank you, Ashley. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk for a few minutes about enrolling in Medicaid and especially for staff who are on from, from jails, what this process looks like if you're not doing it already. I want to start out for a minute on really who is eligible for Medicaid. And while Ashley touched on this, I wanted to share some basic income limits because, as Ashley mentioned, Medicaid is an in most, the majority of it is really an income based program. And also highlight that that first column there, the childless adult column. And that's really the name for the Medicaid expansion group. So that group was not eligible before 2019. And now someone who doesn't meet one of the other groups for Medicaid, such as having a disability or being over age 65 or being a child or a, a parent with very low income, but then they can now qualify for Medicaid. And this has really opened the doors for uh, jails and Department of Corrections facilities because now the vast majority of people who are incarcerated are eligible for, to enroll in Medicaid. And one, we did a survey with this project a few months ago, and one thing that it seems like a lot of people had a misconception about was that previous incarceration or legal system involvement would prohibit someone from being eligible for Medicaid. And I just want to clear up, like it has no impact at all. 
So that um, seems to be a misconception out there. So previous legal system, justice system involvement does not impact Medicaid eligibility. And the thing I want to talk about in a minute, though, is that people, while they're incarcerated, though they're potentially eligible for Medicaid, they only receive a limited benefit package while incarcerated. So next slide, please. Thanks. So when looking at what is covered during an, an incarceral stay, Medicaid can cover hospital costs and charges incurred during that hospitalization. So if there's a surgery and you have to pay the surgeon, like Medicaid can cover that um, as long as it's part of an admission of 24 hours or more. So that's all Medicaid covers for people while they're incarcerated, but those are often the big ticket um, issues for individuals. So while someone's incarcerated, Medicaid does not cover follow-up care, even if it had to do with that hospitalization, doesn't cover that. It also does not cover any other outpatient treatment and Medicaid does not cover medication assisted treatment or sub treatment services while someone is incarcerated. Uh, but it does cover those hospitalizations. And individuals can apply for Medicaid at any time during their incarceration. And there's really kind of two, two reasons they would do this. One is that they want their hospital stay covered, so they want coverage during incarceration. And the other is that they want to have coverage, Medicaid coverage set up so that day one of reentry, they can have Medicaid in the community. And jails and Department of Corrections has been able to, if a few years back, jails really wanted to start enrolling pregnant women in Medicaid while they were incarcerated to have the births covered. But there were lots of challenges because for those of you who do applications for a jail or Department of Corrections, you know this is not a super easy process. Or, and so what Virginia did, and Virginia's unique in this, it actually set up a special unit within the Cover Virginia system, which is does eligibility for all anyone who wants to apply for Medicaid in Virginia, is set up the Cover Virginia Incarcerated Unit. All, it's referred to as the CVIU. And that team at Cover Virginia is specifically dedicated to helping jails and Department of Corrections or any assisters who are helping with applications for people while they're incarcerated to specifically process their applications. So next slide, please. So I mentioned that you may want Medicaid coverage for someone or help them while they're incarcerated to have that hospital stay covered. The other important piece that really ties in with what we were, what Ashley was talking about is Medicaid, setting up Medicaid coverage for reentry. And so for individuals who know they're going to be released soon, they can also apply for Medicaid coverage up to 45 days prior to their release for their coverage to begin as soon as they're released. And Medicaid covers, as Ashley mentioned, medical services, mental health services, substance use treatment services, dental, long-term services and supports. It's a very robust benefit package. And I'm just gonna repeat this because this is, I think, really pretty complicated that individuals re receive, as Ashley mentioned, that fee for service or the first, it's about the first month post-release. And so they're not directly enrolled in a health plan like Virginia Premier or Optima. They are, they are initially enrolled in fee for service. And again, there's the information on Magellan of Virginia that can help coordinate behavioral health services for you know, kind of day one when someone is released. Next slide, please. So a few minutes on just nuts and bolts. If you are a jail staff, Department of Corrections staff, 
or if you're an application assistant that's going into jails you know, remotely or in person to help people while they're incarcerated apply for Medicaid. The two most popular ways that jail staff are helping individuals apply for Medicaid right now, one is emailing a paper application and two is using the CBIU call center. So this slide is on the paper application, but some of this information is transferable to, to when they're, if they want to do a call to the CBIU. So to do the email a paper application process, you download the application from this link. It's on the Cover Virginia website, and the application is available in English and Spanish. And you work with the applicant to make sure they have their legal name and social security number and date of birth, and then have them complete the application. And you wanna make sure that it is legible, that there've been a lot of applications that have been returned or not processed timely because they're not, they're not clear. So make sure it's super clear print, um, or you can help, you can actually handwrite it yourself as long as the individual's providing the information. Um, a couple tips. You want to, there's this Appendix C in the application. You want to ask the applicant to, if it's okay to include you as this application assister, because that way you can have course, get correspondence on the application, you can call and ask questions, and you can help facilitate that application getting completed. And this is sort of like a public service announcement on the addresses, but um, if if you please, for the home address, list the physical address of the jail, the mailing address field. I know this sounds detailed, but I just want to get this information out there. The mailing address, list the jail, the jail mailing address if it's different than the physical address. And then in the body of the email or just handwrite it on the application paper, the applicant's home address in the community if they have an address to give. A lot of times they'll give. Um, people will give like their mom's address or just some uh, stable home address if they have that available. And that will help with reentry because that's where like their cards will be sent at reentry. And then you <laughs> scan that in. Um, ideally, you have secure email and you make sure that application is signed, proofread it, and then you email that application to the cbiu.eligibility at covervirginia.org address. And you can put, this is a new application in the subject line. Next slide, please. The other popular way is over the phone. And so you can, when you, if you have the applicant with you, typically you wanna prep, have them review the application prior to the phone call. But, um, so download the application and review it with the individual and then call the CBIU together, and the individual can participate in the phone interview, and they don't have to sign anything extra. They're, that phone will call their voice, acts as their signature. And again, you wanna be listed as the application assister if they're willing to do that. And to follow up on that application, it will give you this T number, it's a tracking number for the application. You wanna write that down. And then you can email to follow up on the status of the application. Next slide, please. And if you're a provider and you know that someone has just left, uh, been just released or just left jail, then uh, even though they've had that justice system involvement, you can actually, you should actually use the main Cover Virginia line. Uh, if you would like to help someone apply, and so those phone numbers are there. You can also help an individual here in the community complete an application online at commonhealth.virginia.gov. Uh, you can also have help them complete an application at the health insurance marketplace. Those are processed at the federal marketplace, but they are processed, um, you know, on behalf of Virginia there. So those that works. Um, you can also just handwrite the application and turn it into your local Department of Social Services, or you can call the DSS Enterprise Call Center. Next slide. 
and a few other application processing uh, pointers. Uh, the goal for a completed application that's straightforward and like, there's clear handwriting and it's signed is the CBIU hopes to make the, those determinations within five business days or send out the verification checklist, but they do have 45 days to process the application. But if you haven't heard back in a couple weeks, like 10 days, go, I would suggest emailing to make sure that application is in the queue. Um, after processing, the applicant will receive a notice of action or a verification checklist. And it is sent to the mailing address or that home address listed. And so ideally you put the jail address in there so you'll get that information back. And that verification checklist is just gonna request additional information. The notice of action says you're approved or denied. That's your decision. Um, again, you can check the application status and there is the Medicaid application process guide for correctional facilities that is on the Cover Virginia website. That's um, covervirginia.org um, forward slash CBIU. And I knew that that was fast, but I, I hope that information is helpful to you. And I'll turn it back over to uh, Christine. so much to our presenters today for all that wonderful information. I believe I'm going to pass this, uh, this presentation over to Adam Kredling. He will bring up some of the questions that were entered into the chat box and the Q&A box, and then we'll ask our panelists those questions. So just give me a second. Can you all hear me? And so I believe, Rebecca, you've already answered this question, but I'll pose it to you again in case other folks may not have been able to read the question. Um, but the question was, do non-users also have opiate receptors in their brain, or does the opiate use create these receptors? And are there receptors made over time or through dosage of opiates? Yeah, it's a great question. No, we all physiologically have the receptors in there, and it's actually how we actually treat pain and specifically acute pain. It's just that uh, when those that have opiate use disorders, those receptors are accustomed to being filled. And so it's the discomfort of the receptors not being filled um, that actually, um, you know, it, that's a real simplified way of, of explaining it. But um, we all have them. It's just uh, the withdrawal from having a filled receptor that um, those cravings come from. And with the cravings also comes significant physical withdrawal symptoms um, for them. And those can, I always say it's it's the most severe flu you've ever had, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, shaking, um, you know, overwhelming sense of doom, um, and so. Great, thank you, Rebecca. I believe this question is to you, Ashley. Can community-based reentry organizations in Virginia help individuals process their applications? Yeah, I, actually, I think I might pass that to Suzanne uh, to talk about the application process. I think the, the short answer is yes, absolutely. And uh, I know that a number of organizations have been also interested in working more closely with jails to help, especially reentry applications get processed. So. Uh, yes, and if someone has a question on that, they're they're welcome to reach out to me directly, and I can help put them in contact with some folks. Great, thank you, Suzanne. Um, so, what benefits are available for in incarcerated individuals with DOC coverage? Would that to you, Ashley, or you can Suzanne? I can take that. It it again is it's really just a hospitalization. So it's a hospitalization of 24 hours or more. That's at a hospital admission and not just an observation stay. But once the, the coverage attaches to the location, so like when they're in the hospital, anything tied to that should be covered. So if they have labs and they have you know, different you know, anesthesiologist and a, another surgeon, like all of that should be covered by through it through the fee for service program for through Medicaid, but none of the follow up care once they go back to the jail or DOC facility, then 
it's not covered that Medicaid doesn't kick in again unless they're they have another admit hospital admission. And that's federal law, that's that's not state law. Awesome, thank you. So another question. We've been told that inmates can only apply for Medicaid with CVIU 45 days or less from their release date. It looks like that has changed. Yes, they can apply at any time. If they apply before the 45, 45 days, they'll, they can have that incarcerated coverage. So that will cover them for a hospitalization while they're incarcerated. And they, this year, the, the CBIU, GMAS, and Department of Corrections and the Compensation Board have all worked together to develop and implement a, a data match. And so they are now, when individuals come in to a carceral setting and they have, they've had current Medicaid in the community, that data match is matching them and the CBIU is transitioning their coverage from community coverage to incarcerated coverage. And the same thing is happening now on the way out. So upon when someone has incarcerated coverage and then they are released, when that release information goes through the data match, then the CBIU is transitioning their coverage from incarcerated coverage back to community coverage. And they do that on a daily basis. There's a slight lag, like if they don't do it on the weekends, and then, you know, by the time it's usually probably about a 48 hour lag. So if you're not seeing that and you're seeing a lot of people being released from jail or or DOC facility who, if you're in the community and you see a lot of people who still have incarcerated coverage, then I can actually share that if you let me know, because that should be working now would be super helpful information. And if you also need someone's coverage to start, community coverage to start on the exact day that they're released for basically like a pickup from jail to go into treatment, then my suggestion is call the CBIU the day before and then again that more the next morning. And they'll they might have a preference, but they can actually flip the coverage to community coverage really fast for you to make that happen. But that really will require a phone call at this point. Awesome. Thank you, Suzanne. It looks like we are at time and we, we have received a lot of great questions. Um, unfortunately, we're not able to get to them during this presentation, that, but we will respond um, individually after this presentation. But I will turn it back over to you, Christine. Thank you, Adam. Yes, we recognize we're out of time and we're tons of questions. So what we'll do is create a frequent ask questions document and we'll send those out with the presentation materials. So we'll send out a location of today's recording, a uh, slide deck and the FAQ. Thank you so much to all our presenters today and thank you so much for your time. Um, please feel free to reach out to the support at grant. I put the email into the chat, supportgrant at dmass.virginia.gov. Um, if you have any questions, um, we are happy to help assist. Thank you so much. Thanks.